or Psalms 142. Look with me in verse number one. I'm going to read the entirety of the chapter. Just be thankful it's not Psalms 119 this evening. He said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge fell me, no man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall come past me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. And you look at the chapter here in the very top here in my Bible, it says this, A masculine of David, a prayer when he was in the cave. That word masculine simply just means this, a word or a prayer of instruction. So I want to take David's thought and just preach on it for a little bit. A word of instruction from the cave of adversity. Word of instructions from the cave of adversity. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you now to help us as we preach the word of God. Help us, Lord, to say everything we should say. Guard our lips, say nothing we shouldn't. I pray for the child of God tonight that may be walking through adversity. I pray tonight would be a night to see that you're there to help us in the time of need. God, help us to leave here refreshed knowing that you're there. For it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen and amen. I began to think about David as he's sitting here in this cave. David has found himself in some adversity. He's found himself in a place where probably he thought he would never be. And can I say to you and I, there's days in a Christian life where we may wake up one morning and find ourselves in a place where we thought we'd never be. Maybe we got a phone call last week and we thought how we how we never would have gotten that phone call. We would have never had this situation arise. But for some odd reason, now we found ourselves in a cave of adversity. They tell me at Adversity is defined as this. It's an event or a series of events which oppose the success of one. And it goes against their desires. It's misfortune. It's calamity. It's distress. It's simply put a state of unhappiness. And can I say, you ain't got to go to Walmart tonight to find some unhappy people. You can come to the house of God and there's probably somebody in here tonight that's not happy. Things just ain't going your way. The road hasn't always just been easy. And can I say to you and I this evening, hey, I was never promised an easy road when I got saved. Y'all sang the song this morning, the Fosters did. He never promised me those things, but what he did promise me, he's going to be with me, amen? I began to think about David, and as David is sitting here in this cave, he said in verse number four that he's all alone. He said, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there's no man that would know me. I began to think about this, and there was days in my life where I was all alone. There was days in Iraq and Afghanistan where sitting by myself I began to ponder on days that had gone by and I don't know about you any hunters here you sitting in a tree stand you begin to wonder about things and ponder about life and you think about how things gone by I began to think about David and he's probably sitting there saying man I can remember some better days and I don't know about you in adversity but you probably start to think there were some days where things a whole lot easier. Things were a whole lot better. I had it really good. When I was in Iraq, I said, man, I had it good at Grammy's house. Praise God. I mean, I go to the pantry and there's always little Debbie's in the cupboard. Hallelujah. And now I can't even get an MRE. Anybody bear witness there? But here's the thing. David's probably pondering. He's probably reminding himself of his conversion. You said David had a conversion? Sure he did. Think about it with me. We're introduced to David when he's sitting in a sheepfold taking care of his father's sheep. And in doing so, somebody comes to him and says, hey, the man of God needs to see you. Now, when I was in church preacher, when the preacher wanted to see me, it wasn't because I was a good boy. It was because I was playing hide and go rafters of the church, all right? But here's the thing. David wasn't in any mischief. The man of God needed to see him. He makes his way down to the valley and goes to his house there God tells Samuel that this is the next king over Israel. David bows down and can I remind you before he ever bowed down he was a what? He was a shepherd. Can I remind you what the shepherds were? They were the cast. They were the nobodies. They were the ones that nobody cared about. They were the ones when they would come to town everybody get on the other side of the street because nobody wanted to fellowship with the shepherd. Kind of reminds me before I got saved. I was the outcast of the world, the nobodies of the world. Nobody loved Brother Nathan. Why? Because I was lost and on my way to hell. But God. You said, what happened to David? Well, God showed up on David's behalf and said, David, you don't deserve this. It ain't in your lineage. It ain't part of you. You can't buy this, but I'm going to put something 
you that no man can take away. And preacher, I'm glad I got saved that day and nobody can pluck me out of the hand of God. David went down to nobody, but God anointed him and he came up with somebody, amen? And when he went down, he was just a lowly shepherd boy, but when God got on him, God made him a king. And I will tell you something, I'm glad to know tonight, if you're lost, on your way to hell there's a God that loves you and wants to save you and that world may hate you and, how, and those that despise you but I'm glad there's somebody in heaven that says I died for you and want to accept you into the fall and if you'll come down and bow down and give your life to him you can become somebody in him amen so we have David's conversion but then not only that we have David's calls think about it the very next chapter who shows up we talked about in the Sunday school Goliath shows up on his doorstep I don't know about you, but when I got saved, it wasn't very long before giants started showing up in my land. Yeah. Them things that would hinder me in my walk with God. Those things that would hinder me in my daily walk with God. And preach, can I say, I, I'm trying not to go there, but it's headed there real quick. Hey, can I just say, hey, c c convictions and standards are still right. right. Oh, yes. I'm thankful for some convictions in my life. I'm thankful for some standards in my life. But can I say, where did I get them? I got them from some preaching from the man of God. I got it from reading my Bible and the Word of God. I got it from being with God. And God put some things in my life that separated me from this world. Yeah, Amen. Amen. Yeah. David said, hey, the... I'm going to go down and check on the battle. He gets down there. What does he find? He finds a lot of people who should be standing as a bunch of cowards. Yeah, yeah. In 2024, you look across the landscape of our churches today, there's not a lot of men doing a lot of standing anymore. Right. Right. Instead, it's the women. And can I say, God help us men to do some standing in our day. Right. You say, preacher, you know we got a bad leader. So did David. David said, I'm going to stand. Yeah. They, you say, preacher, we got a lot of people that ain't doing it. David said, no, there ain't a lot of people doing it. But Brother Adrian, he said, I'm going to do it. And can I say, if we get a hold of what Joshua said, but it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hey, it's going to have to be a personal decision in our lives that we're going to serve God. Amen. David looked around and he said, is there not a cause? Can I ask y'all, Emmanuel Baptist Church, is there a cause tonight? Is there a reason why y'all are here? Yeah. Is it just because we can see who's here and see the newest trends and the best patterns and who's got what on? Or is the reason why we're here to see sinners saved? Yeah. I mean, Cincinnati, we just talked about had a gay pride parade yesterday. Hey, there's people outside these walls that are dying and going to hell, but who's going to tell them? Right. Right. You are. Yeah. Right. My call is the Denmark preacher, yeah. but y'all's is here. Right. Hey, David said, there's a cause. So David goes and he makes his way down into the valley. And as he gets to the valley, I preached on it this morning. He knelt down and got those five smooth stones out of the brook. That flowing water is a picture of the ghost of God moving and working. David said, before I ever get to battle, I need to get a hold of God. And can I say to y'all, before you ever go fight the Philistines in your life, you better get some God on you. Preach the thing you said today, you better not listen to YouTube. You better not get your theology off the internet. Hey, I say amen to that because, hey, what? to happen is if you go man's philosophy you're going to fall right. but if you'll get a hold of what God is and what God says you'll conquer that giant once and for all right. he got five stones now brother you'll love this every day when I worked for the state police you know what I did I made sure my guns were fully loaded I made sure my backups were loaded I mean I made sure my teeth my dog's teeth were brushed can you believe that why because I knew that there was an enemy without the gates David said, I got to get five stones because I know Goliath's got four brothers. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. You're going to take down one of the giants in your life, but if you're not real careful, more are going to pop up. Right. You may get victory over one, but you're going to get victory over all. Yeah. And God don't want us to live this thing where, well, preacher, I've got a giant in my life this day, and now I've got it conquered, but then i got another one, and what do I do now? Hey, God wants to give us, Brother Cook, total victory over all. Yeah. David got him, went forward. The Bible, the Bible says he ran to the battle. He made his way, and what happens? Goliath sees him, and he says, David, I'm going to tear your flesh asunder. No man's going to remember your name. I'm going to feed your flesh to the fowl of the air. But David looked at him, preacher, and said, yeah, you come to me with a sword and a shield, but I come in the name of the Lord. Hey, can I say to you, we see David's triumph here where David says, hey, it ain't in me and it ain't in you, but it's in God and God alone. Brother Adrian, I'm glad to know today that David's triumph was in God. God gave him the victory. God was going to give him the victory over that giant. David sends a stone forward. What happens? The giant comes tumbling down. Now, here's what I find interesting, preacher. 
the men of Israel didn't shout the victory when Goliath fell. They stood there for a minute. And Brother Adrian, as they're looking at him, they're probably thinking, yeah, David got him down, but the giant ain't out. He's just asleep. Maybe he's just knocked out. That giant's going to get up. And can I say to you, if you're not real careful, that giant could get up again. But what did David do, Brother Adrian? He ran and stood on top of Goliath. And the Bible says he drew Goliath's sword out and he cut his head off. Hey, can I say to you, preacher, it'd be real good if maybe some people in the manual tonight said, preacher, I've been battling this giant over and over and over. I bring it to the altar just to pick it up and take it home again. And then it raises it up again. And here I'm battling this giant over and over. I can't get the victory. Preacher, what do I do? You lop his head off. Maybe you got to super glue the knob on the radio station. Maybe you got to turn the computer off and give it to the wife. Yeah. Is that all right, preacher? Yeah. I mean, maybe we got to watch what we do on the television. You say, why, preacher? Because those giants in your life are going to try to take the victory from you. Right. You say, preacher, I'll never fall. Preacher, we talked about a man today just before service. A year ago, me and him sat in a church service, and he handed me a message, and he said, there ain't no way in this world I'm ever going to do that. I'm not going to go that direction. I'm not going to turn my back on this. I'm not going to fall. Tonight he has fallen and he's in the place where he said he never would be. You know what happened? He didn't cut the head off of the giants in his land. And the giant got the victory. But here's the thing. When the giant got his head cut off and David lifted it up, then the Bible says that the people of God were filled with joy and they shouted for David in the glory of God and the Bible said they drove the Philistines out of the land right. I'm interested brother Adrian right there because it didn't say David did it they all did it wouldn't it be something brother if some people of God and I said brother I'm going to go down and get this giant taken care of and then they say hey I got the giant taken care of my life and then preacher somebody over here says yeah so did I and pretty soon all of the Philistines in our lives is driven out. You want total revival tonight? Get the Philistines out of the land and you can have revival in your life once and for all. So here's David and now David is making himself an entry into Jerusalem. What do the women say about David? Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. Can I tell you what they're saying? David's the man for 2024. That's what they're saying. We need him as our leader. Hey, but can I say to you today, David realized that it wasn't in him that made him a leader. It was God. Can I just say this, Brother Cook? Hey, my hope isn't in the White House tonight. My hope isn't, I don't know, what's the capital of Kentucky? Frankfurt. My hope ain't in Frankfurt, Kentucky. My hope ain't in Atlanta, Georgia. My hope tonight is in heaven. Amen. I'm glad I've got a God who rules and reigns and he sets them up and he brings them down. And Brother Foster, I ain't worried about who's going to get it this year. I'm praying God to give us a good leader. But if he don't, he's still on the throne, church. And if he don't, we're still going home to heaven. And if he don't, this is all lined up according to his will. Hey, our victory tonight is in him and him alone. So here's where we find David. David has found himself in a palace. He should be in the sheepfold, but now he's in the palace. And in that palace, he finds himself next to a man. I put this learning, Brother Adrian, how to be a king. Can I remind you, David didn't know how to be a king. But now he found himself, Brother Cook, in a place where he can learn. Yeah. And he got close to Saul. Every time that evil spirit would come in, he would play the harp, and the evil spirit would depart. What happened, Brother Adrian? David got around and close to the man he was trying to replace. When I got saved, I didn't know how to be a preacher. I didn't know how to pastor. So what did I do? I got close to some men of God who knew. Brother Foster, I got close to some men of God that I could trust. I got around the brethren. But you know what happened? The same thing that happened to David when God blessed him, brother, same thing happened to me. When the brethren see the blessings, they begin to throw javelins. What does Saul say? The Bible says Saul saw the blessings of David, and he feared them from that day forward. Preacher, I don't know about you, but there's been days in my life where church hurt has about caused me to quit on God. I've been in a place, preacher, where I thought, man, those who said, Brother Nathan, as long as you preach the Word of God, as long as you preach the book, as long as you stay with the King James, as long as you stay with the fundamentals of the faith, we're going to be with you until I went down there, Tater Row. And God said, there's sin in the camp. I dealt with the sin in the camp, and the very next thing I find is a jab thrown in my head. Can I say church hurts one of the worst hurts you'll ever face in your life? But I'm glad to know there's a God in heaven to help you in your time of need. Where do we find David, Brother Adrian? He had to flee for his life because of bitterness in the house. 
And I don't know about y'all, and I don't know where you're at tonight, but I'm going to say something. Bitterness in the house will cause people to hurt. And you can find yourself in some adversity. Long introduction. Here's the three things, and we're going to go to the skyline. Praise God. Look at your Bible with me. What's the instruction when David got to the cave of adversity? Number one, look at your Bible, verse number three. He said, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. David realized that the word of hope and instruction for you and I is knowing that your father will prove himself in the time of affliction. David said these words, thou knowest. Religion, who's he speaking to? You're the educator. Amen, professor educator. Amen. He ain't speaking to his father Jesse, is he? He's not speaking to his father Saul or the man of God Samuel. He said, God, the God of glory, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, the one who put the breath in humanity, the one who got the government resting on his shoulder is the one who knows where I'm at tonight. I believe maybe in his mind he went to Psalms 37 where he said the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Can I help y'all with something? If you look at your Bible, I don't find anywhere where David made this cave. David didn't go down there with a shovel or make his men go down there with a, with a hammer and cave, carve out this cave. So who made the cave, preacher? God did. See, here's what the devil's real good about. Look at where you got yourself. Look at this hurt that you're in. You made this. But David said in Psalms 37, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That tells me the moment I got saved, the goodness of God indwelled me. And that's the only good that is in me is because of him. And at that moment, my steps are ordered by God. And he knew that there was going to come a day when David was going to need a cave, a place of refuge, a place of solidarity, a place to get along with God. Hey, you may feel alone this evening and all hope is gone, but God has brought you to a cave of adversity for you to realize that God is going to do something in your life. Preacher, when I got saved, my pastor told me to pray specifically for a spouse. So I started, I'm from Western North Carolina. I started praying God to give me a wife from Georgia. You say, why? I got tired of Tar Heels. Amen. I need a Georgia peach. Praise God. And so, long story short, I met Stephanie. Guess where she's from? <laughs> Georgia. And so, Brother Doug, we get married. But while I was praying for her, I prayed that God would give me a firstborn son. That was a desire of mine. And guess what? We find out after we're married, a year into it, a year and a half, we find out we're expecting Braden. Now, Brother Adrian, everything's going my way. I'm in church. I'm a tither. Give the missions. Soul winning. You name it. Active. Doing everything I'm supposed to do. There comes a day on vacation where I leave South Dakota and drive to Western North Carolina. Now, when I drive, we drive until the tank goes empty. Then we go in, get what we need to get, take the gas tank out, and drive until it gets empty again. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so in doing so, my wife's expecting Braden. She's great with child. 25 hours, ladies, in a car, one way. Brother Doug, I'm a naive kid. I didn't know any better. And so we get to Western North Carolina. My, we're sitting there about 2 o'clock in the morning and talk to my family. My wife looks at me and she says, something's wrong, get me to the hospital. Being the good husband that I am, brother, I said, take two baby aspirin and call me in the morning. It'll be okay. She said, no, something's wrong. The baby hasn't moved in hours. Brother Doug, I load her up. We get to the hospital. We walk in. They begin to run tests on her. And the doctors walk in a little bit later. And here's what the doctor says. Ma'am and sir, I don't know how to tell you this, but tonight you're going to lose your son. And then they stopped and turned their direction to me and said, not only are you going to lose your son, but your body and your wife is going to die tonight as well. Brother Doug, everything that I prayed for and everything that I longed for and everything that God had given me, in a matter of seconds, the words of a doctor took it all away. And Brother Adrian, I found my place of self in a cave of adversity, a place where I couldn't do anything. I couldn't change the medical side. I couldn't pay enough money to save them. I couldn't do enough good to help them. I found myself in a place of helplessness. So what did you do, Brother Nathan? Well, David said, I poured out my complaint before him. Brother Adrian, I went down that old explorer, crawled in the back of it, and here's what I prayed to God. God, whatever your will is, I'll accept it. Brother Doug, I just got out doing a study out of Job. Job said, the Lord giveth 
and the Lord taketh away. I didn't find anywhere where Job said this, the Lord taketh away, I'm going to make a deal with him. Yeah. The Lord has done some atrocity against me. I let me go make a deal. Can I help you? God ain't in a deal-making mood. He wasn't in a deal-making mood when he saved you. He ain't in a deal-making mood with his will. God has a purpose and a plan. It's our job as a child of God to trust him and accept his will. But that was the hardest prayer I ever prayed in my life because at that moment, I said, God, if you kill him, I'll accept it. If you'll let him live, I'll accept it. But here's what I said, Lord, whatever it is, I'm going to praise your name. For the first time, he spoke to him in over 30 hours. And here's what he said, preacher, it's going to be okay. What does that mean? It's going to be okay that you kill him or it's going to be okay that you save him? What does that mean, brother? I don't know. But I knew this, I had a word from God. In the middle of my adversity, God spoke to me and said, I'm here. Brother Adrian, I walked back in the, hotel, or the, the hospital there. And I kissed my wife on the forehead. She looked up and said, what did God say? Here it is. I'm glad she didn't say what Joel Osteen said. Amen. I wasn't looking for a better me now. Praise God. I needed God to do something. Brother Cook, I said, God said it's going to be okay. She said, I don't know what that means. I said, I don't either, but we're going to trust him. What was it, honey, 45 minutes later? Doctors walked in and Brother Foster, they said, Mr. Johnson, while you were out doing whatever you were doing, we felt like we needed to run some more numbers. Hey, let me tell you what that felt like is in the medical world. That's a providential hand of God moving in their life to make them do something. Amen. They said, we ran those numbers again. And for some odd reason, our computer can't compute it. Our textbooks don't explain it. Our colleagues' minds, the brightest of the world, can't fathom it. But for some odd reason, the numbers have changed. And it looks like your son's going to be okay and your wife's going to be okay. What are you saying? Brother Cook, in the early days of my Christianity with my family, I had a God in heaven that said, hey, I've got the governments on this shoulder. I've got the galaxies in my hand, but I've got a place for you, and I'm going to show you that I can do something that you can't even ask or think. In the middle of my adversity, the Father stepped out and said, I'm going to prove myself in your time of adversity. Why was David able to say that in the midst of his trial? He was able to look back and said, God, you delivered me from a lion. Yeah. You delivered me from a bear. Yeah. And you delivered me from Goliath. I believe you can deliver me with, from this thing with Saul. Hey, can I say back through your life and see where God brought you from and see how many times he showed up time after time after time after time at this place of adversity you're in tonight it ain't no small thing for your God your God's going to show up and do something to where you can say God has done something for me David said in the middle of my adversity know that the father will prove himself man aren't you glad we got a God who cares about you Number two, look with me, verse number four. He said, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge fell me. He said, no man cared for my soul. Here's the interesting thing. David just came from a time of being the most notoriety, the most famous man in all of Israel. He just got done killing Goliath. But here, if we look at this verse, Brother Adrian, I studied this right he by himself he's all alone right here he said I looked at my right hand no man cared for me nobody loves me you know what the devil's really good about making you feel like you're all alone in this thing making you feel like nobody cares about you your pastor don't care about you your people of God don't care about you nobody loves you oh brother I'm glad I know there's some people to help me in my time of need Know this, that in your time of adversity, your friends will prove themselves. You say, there ain't no friends here with David. I'm glad you brought that up. Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel 22. While you're doing that, I'm going to tell you a little... It's not, I didn't ask, preacher. I'm going to a little bit to you what God's done for me. Because if God can do it for me, I'm a nobody. If God can do it for me, I know he can do it for y'all tonight. So I'm pastoring, Brother Adrian, and everything's going good at the church. We're in a spirit of revival having people say people join the church I mean it's just wonderful on a Monday morning Malia Malia raise your hand back there so everybody can see you everybody see Malia embarrass her real good that's Malia brother Doug I, she let out a blood curdling scream she's 14 months old I run in and I grab her and she lays her head down on my shoulder long story short Stephanie gives her and starts ironing and starts doing stuff and she realizes that every time she sits Malia up she falls over on her right side 
We look at her and her face is drawn to the right. The rest of her body is paralyzed. The doctors tell us later that day, Brother Cook, that she had a stroke at 14 months old. I stood there, Brother Edge, in the hospital and praying, God, ask God to do a work. Y'all look at her now, you can't even tell she's had one. We thank God for that. But here's what happened with the stroke, where the deadness was in the back of the brain, that dead cell. It opened the door for seizures to start triggering her body. And for five months straight, preacher, every month, one, at least once a month, she would have a seizure. One after another. And they progressively gotten worse and worse. On the fifth month, she has a seizure. And I'm sitting in the hospital. And guess what it seems like? Nobody cares. Because here's the thing. When people hear of that same affliction over and over in one person's life, we get callous to it. Oh, they're going through that again. Oh, it's just brother so-and-so. You know how it, he just has that issue. And brother Doug, pretty soon we forget to pray for that person. We forget to check up on that individual. We forget to send them maybe a text message or a call saying, hey, we're praying for you, we love you. Is everything okay? But you know what happened the first time she had a seizure? My phone was inundated with phone calls and text messages. But on the fifth one, I don't even have church members sending me texts. I don't even have hardly anybody calling me. Preacher, if this gets me in trouble and this drops my support, oh well. I'm sorry, I'm just being truthful tonight. I'm sitting right here at Mission Hospital in Nashville, North Carolina, and I see my wife holding my baby. Preacher, I looked at him, I said, God, you've done so much in my life. And you've done so much for me. But now I'm sitting here in this cave all alone nobody's calling, nobody's texting. I feel like I'm all by myself. God, you've even forsaken me, it feels like. God, if you ain't going to touch her, I quit. I'm done. I can't handle it no more. The pressure is just so great. I can't do it. Brother Doug, you know what I told my wife? God's going to do it. It's going to be okay, honey. Everything's going to be all right. Why? Because I'm the husband. I'm the preacher. I got to put on that good face, Brother Adrian. But in my heart, I quit. About four hours later, the back of the hospital room opens up and there stands a man by the name of Stacy Piercy. And I looked at him and I said, Brother Stacy, you're supposed to be in Georgia tonight preaching. He said, yes, sir. But I was four hours away praying this morning what God would have me to do. Doug, I didn't put it on Facebook. And I didn't put it on social media, but I prayed to a God who knew the groanings of my heart. And he said, when I was praying what God had me to do, he said, I needed to get to North Carolina and see you. He said, I turned my truck around on I-75 E-line straight for the hospital. And he said, on my way here, I prayed what God would have me to say to you. He handed my wife a teddy bear and a balloon for Malia and said, God told me to tell you, preacher, don't you dare quit. God ain't done with you. God's got a work for you to do. God's got a ministry. God's using you. I know the devil wants you to feel like you're alone, but you're with the body of Christ, and I'm here for you, and I'm praying for you, and we love you. Preacher, don't you quit on God. What are you saying? I'm glad to know today that there's men and women of God that's in tune with the Holy Ghost. When they see somebody hurting in the church, they'll go and say, I'm praying for you. I love you. I care for you. You're not in this thing by yourself. We're going to undergird you and strengthen you and help you in your time of need. Amen. You say, show me what happened in the Bible. I'm glad to. Look at 1 Samuel 22. David prayed this prayer. And here's what happened. 1 Samuel 22, 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all of his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Here's the thing. I don't know who they heard it from, but I know they heard it, the Bible says. And when they heard it, preacher, they didn't have to see it. Right. Too many times we got to say, well, let us prove. No, they said when they heard it, they went down thither to them. Now look what happens. When they heard it, they went down thither to him. And the Bible says this, and everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. Now here's the thing, preacher. When I got saved, I always got taught I was in the body of Christ. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when one body part hurt, they all pretty much hurt. You say, I don't believe it. Let's go shut your thumb in the door of the car and let's see if your whole body hurts. Amen. But one thing I realized real quick, when I would chase some fugitive through the swamps of Georgia 10, 15 miles, man, I'd be on a drilling high. I'd go to walk. Our celebration, brother, y'all may not do this around here, but when we got done catching somebody, we would celebrate that we got home safe. And we go in at the Waffle House. Oh, yes. 
all-star breakfast over medium eggs, hash browns, chocolate chip, waffle, praise. God, I'm feeling good right now. Now, brother, here's the thing. I get home and I be on an adrenaline high and a sugar high. I go down, wake up the next morning, collapse on the floor. You know why? Because his right knee is bad. But guess what happened? About the moment that I fall, that left knee would catch it and undergird it. And I was able to walk because I had someone stronger helping the other one out. Now, here's the thing. You may be weak tonight, but aren't you glad you got a man of God who may be stronger than you? They say, hey, I see you in your time of affliction, your pain and agony. Hey, let me come underneath you and help you and say, hey, God ain't done with you. God's going to use you. But then aren't you glad, preacher, there's some people in this church that loves their man of God. And when they see you coming in weary and tired from the road and y'all letting him go preach all these revivals, can I just say thank you because he helps my family when he goes out. Hey, preacher, when you come home, they see you're tired and weary, you're weary and worn out. They say, hey, preacher, don't worry about it. We got it. Hey, you know what that is? That's the body of Christ working together. But here's the thing. When I got saved and in church and studying, I wanted to be a mighty man of David. I mean, I want to be the man. I, listen, the preacher said, I need a glass of water. I'm kicking grannies away from the water fountain to get him a cup of water. Hey, man, that's my preacher's water. Hey, I want to be the man where the sore clave to his hand, where they couldn't separate it. I wanted to be that guy, but here was the problem. I said, I can never be that man. I'm not that good of a man. But where did David's mighty men came from, preacher? Well, right here. These 400 men. Well, who were they? The Bible said, all those that were in distress. Anybody in here tonight in distress? Sure. How about this one? He said, all those in debt. Yeah. Praise God. Well, everybody, every hand almost better go up right here. And then he said, all those that were discontented. You know what that tells me? God can use the outcasts of this world to strengthen us up. Hey, I'm glad tonight. Preacher, I'm not in this. And I'm glad it ain't the, the Hollywood crowd that supports me. I'm glad it ain't the financial industrial crowd of New York. I'm glad it ain't the uppies. I'm glad tonight, brother. It's the people of God. The ones where the world says we're a nobody. They're the outcasts. But God says they're my people. They're redeemed by my blood. And in doing so, he uses us to upgird one another in the midst of adversity. I believe this. David said, I look under his hills which comes my help. I believe preacher he got done praying that prayer and maybe brother Adrian I'm wrong but he just walked out of that cave and looked and there stood 400 men. He said I don't know who hurt me and I don't know how my God did it but behind the scenes God was working and moving and thank God there's some people to help me in my time of need. You say well where you be at tonight if brother Stacy didn't show up. Preacher I already said I quit. I already told God I quit brother Cook but because of one man coming to where I was and said, God ain't done with you, and I'm there to help you. Guess what happened, church? I'm here tonight because of one man took an interest. How many of y'all are here tonight because of one man or one woman? All right, let your friends show themselves in the time of need. Number three, I'm done. I'm getting out of here. Look at verse number seven. David said, bring my soul out of prison that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Not only know that in time verse your father will prove himself and that friends will prove themselves, but I believe in verse number two when we find the other one. If you look at the verbiage of that verse, he said, bring my soul to prison that I may. He didn't say bring my soul to prison because I did. Praise thy name. He didn't even say bring my soul out of prison because I am praising thy name. That's past tense and present tense. But Brother Cook, he said, bring my soul out of prison that I may. That's future tense. He said, I got enough faith out of glory that he's promised me something that hasn't come to fruition yet. And when my God promises something, he always brings it to pass. David said, I've got enough faith to know that God is real. Know this, know not only your father will prove himself, not only know that your friends will prove themselves, but know that your faith will prove itself in a time of adversity. See, here's the thing. We're saved by faith. And in doing so, the faith that saved you is the same faith that will sustain you. And too many times we look at life and we say, Preacher, you know I would do more for God, but I can't. You know, my finances are limiting me. You know, Preacher, I can't because of this, because of that. But can I say if God has called us to do something, we need to step out by faith and do it. I already spoke about what God's done for our family since I've stepped out, Preacher, by faith. But there came a day where I had to look at being on deputation and there came a day brother where I was working 
state police Monday through Friday. I'd get off and drive to a church on the weekend and present the work, drive back Sunday night. So if it was still going on tonight, we would leave, drive seven and a half hours home. I'd get up tomorrow morning and go to work. And there came a day when my wife looked at me and said, when are you going to quit? And Brother Cook, I said, when God tells me to. Well, sometimes he has to hit me over the head with a baseball bat. My boss came to me and said, you're going to have to choose between this job and preaching. Brother Adrian, I looked at him and said, Lord, I'm still work, trying to build this 401k up enough to where when I do quit, I, maybe I can draw off of it early and have enough money to, because we're not where we need to be on the deputation support level full time. I said, Lord, you know if I quit this job, I would have to have this health insurance from the state to be able to take care of my babies and my family. God, you know I've got to have it. And God all while saying, you need to quit. You need to quit. You need to quit. Bro, Doug, when he, asked, when he put that ultimatum in my face, I said, give me five minutes. Typed up my resignation, sent it to him. Within four weeks of me sending in that resignation, 28 churches took us on for support. You say, what happened? Brother Foster, God said, let me just show you what I can do. He took care of that need where I was at. And he said, hey, you just step out by faith and trust me. I'm going to take care of that need in your life. Your faith will sustain you. There's a day I was pastoring. And preacher, I got to a point where it was a Sunday, Sunday evening. Mama came to me and she said, Nathan, we ain't got no money in the bank account. The stores are closed and there ain't no food to feed the babies. Now, I come from the cloth, the line of cloth where my grandpappy told me that if you eat, those kids eat. But you're not going to eat and those kids are definitely going to eat. You feed them babies. Well, here's the issue, brother. I can't feed them nothing. So what do I do? I could have got on Facebook and said, hey, y'all, will y'all give me cash so I can go feed my babies I could have went to GoFundMe page and started that I mean I could have went to the deacon board and tried to get some more money to pay for my baby something to eat but you know what I did I said I remember God touching George Mueller and providing for him I can remember stories where God would do things for my grandma and my mama and people maybe I'll just trust him in this one I can remember what he's done in the medical field and all those side of our family but God can you provide some food in the midnight hour I went to my prayer closet and said God will you do something to show my babies that the faith we have is real mm. but Doug, how many times does somebody come by and give you a handshake and said God's told me to give you this but your kids never saw it they didn't understand they just knew there was food on the table or maybe you went to the mailbox and opened it up and there was a check and you put it in I mean Malia the other day she don't understand the principle she said daddy there's that square thing go get money out of it Amen. it don't work that way baby <laughs> kids don't understand that I wanted them to see that we have a God who's real. So, Brother Doug, I went to bed. I prayed that prayer and went to bed. 7, 6, 37 a.m., Brother Cook, the kids start screaming, Dad, Dad, get on the front porch, Dad, come. I mean, I'm grabbing shotguns, pistols, ARs. I'm going locked and loaded. Brother Asian Braden looks at us and says, Dad, it ain't like that. Go put them up. I'm like, oh, man. Put everything up, go back out there. Guess what happened, Brother Doug? I walked out on the porch. And there was a chest freezer sitting there, and then between it was the fence or the, the railing of the porch. And I looked there on there, and there was some makeshift nest. And guess what was in those nests? Fresh chicken eggs. You say, what'd you do? We collected the chicken eggs and we ate them. I'm not Catholic tonight. We did not build a shrine to eggs. But here's what I did, Brother Richard. I looked at my kids and I said, God hath provided our food. God heard my prayer and has sustained us for another day. He gave us something to eat for today. You know what God was teaching me? The faith that saved me is the faith that sustained me. And David realized, hey, I can trust him in this time because he's provided for me time and time and time again. You say, how long do those chicken eggs keep coming? Bro? They kept coming every single morning until the time we moved to Georgia. Every morning was fresh eggs I got so sick and tired of hearing that hen cackle in the morning I went looking for the owners of the chickens and guess what there was no owners of the chickens you know what God said I sent a raven to feed my man in a cave I sent manna down from heaven to feed my people this chicken thing is not that big of a deal for me hey God sent chickens to my door you say what are you saying I don't know where you're at today and I don't know what your 
hearts. <laughs> but I'm glad you've got a God who will prove himself. You've got friends that will prove yourself. But if you'll just humble yourself and pray and say, God, I've just got faith in you to trust you that you will provide my needs. Hey, he said, I will provide my needs and your needs according to my riches and glory. He may not give you your wants tonight but I'm glad to report to you he will give you the needs of your life and I'm glad to see hey I may have been young but now I'm old yeah. preacher I haven't seen the righteous forsaken yeah. or seed begging bread yeah. I don't know where you're at tonight but I can promise you there's a God in heaven that takes interest in you I don't know you're in a cave of verse you say preacher can he do it for me well I'm here to tell you if he's done it for me he can do it for you if he's done it for countless others he can do it for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to preach the word of God. I pray that you'd help your people to see that in the cave of adversity, in the time of need, that you're there to help us. Father, help us to rely on you. Help us to rely on some friends. Lord, help us to trust the faith tonight. God, have your way here at Emmanuel. Touch Brother Doug in this great church. For us, in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.